What's going on guys, Andrew from Newbark Gaming back here, and today we're going to be talking about some Yu-Gi-Oh! of Reigns episode 84. Now the first part of this episode picks up immediately where episode 83 left off, and that is with this epic climax of a duel we're going to get between Revolver and Soulburner, right? Well, not really. Revolver actually ends up refusing to take a turn, and the way he proceeds from there actually shows a lot of character growth on Revolver's part in my mind, and demonstrates once more to us that he's not an outright malicious character, and for the most part, if anything, he's generally a good character who sticks by his own moral code and everything it's just his morals don't necessarily go in line with what the audience is like trained to believe in and what yusaku believes in and what i would personally probably side with if i was in the show but there's a part of him that you have to respect for his consistency and for his devotion and for the way that he do isn't just willing to crush people who may eventually be in his way he's willing to spare everyone that he can while still achieving his goals right and how does he go about doing this well he Outright doesn't take a turn during the duel. He basically is apologizing to Soulburner. Even Flame points this out. Soulburner isn't needed by Revolver. Revolver needs expert hackers right now. Soulburner is nothing more than a really good duelist. And so he brings Soulburner along. He could have gotten Flame through Yusaku, but he brings Soulburner to this meeting anyway because he acknowledges Soulburner was torn up by this thing his father did. And he then allows him to basically get his revenge in this duel, too, because he knows the lost incident ruined his life. Once more, cleaning up his father's mess a bit there. And then Revolver even goes so far as to reveal his identity outside of Link Reigns, something Yusaku had to wait quite some time to get in Season 1 to everybody in this group just in order to earn their trust because Revolver cares about protecting humanity. And there's a part of that you really have to respect. He's basically putting himself at risk. Everybody who's basically been a victim of this lost incident, especially someone like Soulburner who was ready to basically strangle Revolver a few minutes before this, it now knows who he is outside of Link Brains. There's no reason they can't seek real-life revenge against this guy where he can't put up all kinds of hacking walls and such to protect himself because of his knowledge of programming. But he's willing to do it once more. Why? Because there's a greater good at cause here. And I think that's something that you have to respect. Now, adding to that further, I think this was really demonstrating to us where Revolver is coming from at all angles. Re Playmaker remind us in this episode that Revolver was the one who reported the lost incident in the first place in order to get these kids out of a situation that he didn't believe was right whatsoever. So with that being the case, most of Revolver's actions are essentially trying to clean up what he believes to be his father's mistakes. Everything including the Ignises, the lost incident, and even in some ways trying to make amends with people. I mean... Not only did he free the kids from the lost incident, it seems he's almost reaching out to them even if he's doing so indirectly and won't admit that's the way he's going because of his kind of more uh, lone wolf-esque type of personality. He does reach out to Playmaker, he does reveal his identity, he does work with Playmaker a lot now. Soulburner, he does allow to win this duel, he does work with some, he acknowledges that the, he probably may have every right to be angry with him even if he doesn't outright say it, and he invites him to this meeting when he doesn't essentially need him. And then, you know, look at freaking Spectre, who's literally his right-hand man. There's three of our six Lost Incident members right there who Revolver's outright reached out to, kind of, when he's had that opportunity. So there's something about his character I'm really coming to appreciate. I think he's well-written, I think he's well-voice-acted out, and I think it's going to be awesome to see how he unravels. I have a feeling the next time he and Playmaker may face off, it might be a little bit similar to something like Shark from the Barry and Onslaught arc, where it's like, Neither of these sides are exactly right or wrong, but as a result of their paths being conflicting, they do have to face each other, even if they are friends, even if there is a mutual respect there, and maybe together they end up finding a solution that works out for everybody. And that's something I don't mind. I actually liked the way Zexel ended a lot as a result of that, because there was always kind of an ambiguity as to the side. Uh, essentially, you know, you had Shark trying to protect the Baryans, and there were a lot of characters on the Baryan side we'd come to grow very attached to, including Shark himself, and Yuma trying to protect Astral. I mean, it was a very well-written arc, and I have a feeling Yusaku may be in, in a very similar case against Revolver here. Revolver's trying to protect something, he's trying to finish up his goals, and maybe he's something that we can really end up getting behind. You know, they could still develop this further to giving Revolver more behind his side, because I feel like right now the way the show's written, it's hard not to be on Yusaku side since most of the Ignises have done nothing wrong, but they could certainly develop it in a direction where it's more ambiguous the way it was in Zexel. Regardless, I think he's adding a lot to the show right now. Revolver's probably standing as my favorite character in the show right now.
down. So enough about me adoring him, let's go ahead and move on to what goes down in the rest of this episode. We do get a really neat scene between Bowman and Haru. We find that Bowman's basically hooked up to a bunch of cables being programmed further into this ultimate human AI hybrid that Lightning has in mind, and he's having this conversation about Haru and how Haru was programmed to be his younger brother, at least told to behave like his younger brother, and how Bowman can't forget that, but Haru doesn't necessarily feel the attachment a brother probably should. Bowman almost seems stung by this, and I think this is an interesting little reveal and insight into Bowman's emotions for us. After all, we have to remember, even though Bowman's on the side of the AI, Lightning created him with the idea of building on the strengths of both humans and AI. And humans, whether we like, whether it always works for our benefit or not, sometimes our greatest strength is our emotions. It helps us to go that extra mile. It's kind of the idea of, if you have nothing to lose, why are you fighting in the first place? drives those emotions forward. You have something to lose, you have something to get frustrated about, something to defend, something to protect, right? So if he has those emotions, those levels of attachment to a brother, and he's able to feel that kind of human aspect, those sense of instincts, brotherly instincts, if you will, then I think those might be starting to come out a little bit in Bowman here. He seemed almost disappointed in the fact that Lightning's creations couldn't feel the way he could at that moment. And part of me wonders if Bowman's starting to consider, wait a second, if our whole thing is conquering humanity, is it possible that we're going to watch a lot of these beautiful things that humanity brings into creation, such as those brotherly bonds and such, disappear along with them because they don't necessarily coincide with a logic train the way one would, like an AI would necessarily think that's, you know, programmed by somebody like Lightning at least. I don't know if it would necessarily be the case if, say, I programmed them. He seems to more so value that sense of bond, the way he interacts with Yusaku and such. But coming from someone like Lightning, brotherly bonds could seem illogical and unnecessary. And it seems Bowman, even though being programmed by Lightning, acknowledges the value of these. So if he continues along the lines of trying to conquer humanity, is he going to watch those things disappear as well? It's almost like Bowman's having a second thought there. Now, granted, this is very brief, so it's possible I'm reading way too much into it. But I think it could be neat if we have someone who is conflicted going into this battle the way someone like Shark was conflicted being a final antagonist for Yuma in a sense because I mean at the same time you could kind of get behind the burying cause to some extent and Shark definitely still had a lot of attachment to Yuma perhaps Bowman's starting to grow some attachment to his human side as well I mean he mentions you know how to becoming one with him and being able to feel that maybe but he doesn't seem overly excited or determined by towards that ideal the way he initially did when dealing with characters. Adding to our list of small scenes, we also have a little bit of an interaction between Robopi and I here, where I essentially tells Robopi, I'm going to follow through on my promise to make you smart, but it's not really going to be in the way you think. Now, this could be going a number of directions. It's possible I is having some regrets on his deal with Yusaku, and Robopi is going to be his way of kind of planting something to eventually get at a bigger plan here, but... I've never really gotten any malicious vibes uh, from I towards humanity, so I don't really think it's an anything very antagonistic. He seemed very much on Playmaker's side this entire time, even if he did stay starting to become afraid of humans himself. He never seems like he wants to hurt them. Once more, one's actions speak a lot louder than their words, as the old saying goes, and I's actions never seem to be negative towards humanity, and I don't think this would necessarily be the way to introduce that. It doesn't seem overall consistent with his character. So, what could this mean? Well, the way I'm interpreting it, and once more I could be reading way too much into this, is Playmaker mentioned needing to send the a Ignises off into a different realm right after this, somewhere they can hide so that people like Revolver can't hunt them down, somewhere they can exist peacefully without causing infinite conflicts the way they could within humanity because people won't see them as being peaceful even if they are. So perhaps he's going to leave some kind of a connection to Robopi, to himself, that way, if Yusaku's ever in need of help, he can be able to contact Ai. After all, Ai has seemed for a long time to have developed a good bit of a bond to Yusaku, and I doubt he's going to want to necessarily fully let that go. He seemed rather disappointed by the idea of needing to leave Playmaker when Playmaker brought up this whole notion of needing to send them off after this conflict is over. That would be my personal bet as to it. It could also be something much similar in that he's going to train Robopi as kind of a failsafe or a backup during the conflict. Maybe he's going to have Robopi run sort of, some sort of program through regular Link brains to protect it while they're doing other things. I don't know exactly what he has in mind here, but I do think it's an interesting plot point that they made it a key idea to show us this scene. I think there's definitely something important going on there, whether we realize it yet or not. So I'll be curious to see how that ends up playing out. Now, curiously enough, in this episode, the Knights, the Tower of Hanoi, I'm sorry, not the Knights of Hanoi, 
come back, which is odd. I had predicted that may end up happening and that maybe they'd reconstruct the Tower of Hanoi to essentially flush lightning out because it would wipe out Link Brains, giving him nowhere to hide. That's not what they go for. Instead, they use it as a giant search beacon. And funny enough, Revolver gets everybody on his side to reprogram this. He's got Emma, Ghost Girl, I'm sorry, yep, he's got Emma, Ghost Girl, Spectre, Yusaku, Kusanagi, himself, and, um, uh, Spectre, who I already named on that, that renaming names here, um, all working on that in order to search for lightning, and it ends up working. And they're very, very questioning of him at first, but Aqua seems to trust him, so probably nothing to worry about there. So I just think it's a neat little story element that we do see the Tower of Hanoi come back into play here. And it is a little bit concerning that if it's back up and functional on some level, that once this is all over, Revolver could easily twist it back into doing what it was meant to do in the first story arc of the show, which is to wipe out all of Link Brains, and they may just recycle that conflict for the final arc rather than doing something like using soul technologies. I certainly hope not, though it does also open the possibility of like soul technologies gaining control of it or something else. We'll just have to wait and see in that field. I do think it was a nice throwback to bring that back into the show, though. And also, adding to the overall 5D's vibe I get from this show sometimes, By the after you remove Emma to have her oversee regular Link Brains, we're left with five duelists charging into the space, right, to go up against Lightning, Windy, Haru, and Bowman. So it doesn't end up being 5v5 the way Signers versus Dark Signers was supposed to be. Sorry, Crow, I'm still kind of shaky on your whole involvement in that arc. But still, it gives me that kind of feeling that you have these five people charging towards this final conflict, and I guess that's a kind of a consistent theme in Yu-Gi-Oh! where you have like these one-on-one -on -one fights that have been building for a while getting ready to square off. I'm going to be interested to see how this ends up playing out. Uh, I think we've got a neat duel coming up in terms of Aqua versus Haru, especially considering the way it's being built up in terms of the episode title being True Tears. It mentions a lot about sibling understanding of relationships and Haru not understanding his feelings. Assuming they're talking about Haru, they have a tendency to use misdirect sometimes in these previews for the next episodes, right? But if they are talking about Haru, keep in mind who he's set up to duel, and that's Aoi, somebody who does have a real brother. I'm wondering if Haru's going to end up having some level of a change of heart. Even though he wasn't Lightning's perfect idea of a human-AI hybrid, he was his first model, which would imply to me, based off Lightning's skills and such, he is able to feel human emotions on level, on some level. So maybe he may see some flaw with Lightning's plan, maybe we'll see a change of heart on his part, even if it is after the defeat, the way it happened with a lot of the Baryans during the Baryan Onslaught arc. After their defeat, you know, they felt this need to fight for the Baryan world, but they would also kind of admit to Yuma, this wasn't necessarily the conflict I was going for, and they would kind of reveal how they were attached to humans still those types of things. So I think we're heading in a lot of good directions with this, guys. I really enjoyed the scene where all five of these people charged into the battle. I'm going to be curious to see how Revolver and Spectre play out. I think at this point, they're probably my two favorite characters to watch in the show, just because I think they're in that grayer area of morality while still being good and generally having overall good intentions, even if there's some bad stuff in there, like wiping out Ignises who are essentially innocent. So we'll just have to wait and see how all that plays out. As per usual, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe down below. If not, constructive criticism is always welcome, and I'll catch you guys next time on some more Yu-Gi-Oh! Brains.